Good afternoon, all. Thank you for spending your Thursday afternoon with us. My name is Dr. Vanessa Valdez. I have the, had the pleasure of serving as the interim dean of Macaulay Honors College this year. And I welcome you to this program regarding enslavement, the history of enslavement here in New York. I am going to ask my fellow, my panelists to please um, video up as I introduce you. Both of my our, our colleagues from John Jay College of Criminal Justice, it is a pleasure to welcome you, even virtually, to Macaulay Honors <laughs> College. Uh, Dr. Ned Venton is a professor in the Department of Public Management at John Jay College and serves as the director of the MPA Inspector General Program, which is the only MPA program in the US that concentrates expressly on inspection and oversight and the role of inspectors generals. For this, he is also a co-director of the New York Slavery Records Index, which is a searchable compilation of records that identify individual enslaved persons and their owners in New York State, beginning as early as 1525 and ending during the Civil War. Welcome, Dr. Benton. His, his co-director is Dr. Judy Lynn Peters, um, who is a graduate of John Jay College, as well as a, a, a recipient of her PhD at, from Rutgers University in the Department of Public Management. Welcome, Dr. Peters. I, I and our audience are very eager and, and excited to hear from you. So we will be talking, we will be they will be presenting for about 45 minutes and then we will have a Q&A at the end of this. I welcome all questions to be put um, in the chat. Well, I'm sorry, in the Q&A function. Um, and then we will, you know, depending on where we are, depending on the rhythm of this, I may interrupt you. Probably not, but we'll see. And with that, welcome Ned and Judy Lynn. Thank you. I'll, I will start. I'm, to, I'm wearing my Harriet Tubman shirt that says, we out, Harriet Tubman, 1849. Um, I bet that if you grew up in New York City or grew up in New York State or anywhere in the North, you probably grew up believing that slavery was a Southern institution. I know I grew up believing that, and I was actually taught that in schools, that slavery was a phenomenon in the South and that bad people down there were the cause of the Civil War. The reality is very, very different. The reality is that slavery actually began in the North. When the Dutch came and settled New Amsterdam, they brought with them the Atlantic slave trade. And so slavery was not only in New York, it was based in New York for a very long time. And I knew nothing about this until I went and had lunch with my colleague, Ned Benton, one day. We were sitting down at lunch, and as he always does, um, he started talking about what he's doing in his private life. And he's an active member of his local historical society, and he decided at some point to document the history of slavery in his community, which is Larchmont, New York. And so he began documenting enslavement in the town of Mamaroneck, and he would come in at lunchtime and talk about all these different things that he'd found. And I became so fascinated with it, I encouraged him to come to John Jay one evening, because it was during the summer and he wasn't teaching, um, but come in one evening and do a presentation for students. And so we did that. We canceled all our classes one evening, brought all our students into a room, and he talked about what he knew about slavery in New York City, in New York State, excuse me. And as you might imagine, the students were flabbergasted because they had no idea that slavery existed in the North. They had no idea it existed in New York. And at the end of his presentation, he talked about how it also existed right here in New York City. And the students were horrified to learn that our, our major streets and thoroughfares, um, statues in our parks, art in our museums are all um, named for enslavers. So I encouraged Ned to replicate his research here at John Jay College. And uh, we agreed to do that. Of course, I had to take part in that. And what we very quickly discovered was that we couldn't limit our investigation to New York City. So we began documenting the institution of slavery in the state of New York. We collected colonial records, um, census records, um, 
every piece of documentation we could find. And we very quickly began to develop a repository of information. In 2018, November of 2018, we launched the New York State <clears throat> Slavery Records Index, which had approximately 30,000 documents, every single piece of information we could amass about the institution of slavery in New York. We also decided to involve our students in this research because we thought this is something really important for our students to know about. And as part of John Jay's mission to be fierce advocates for justice, um, we are all about teaching people truth. And so our students became active, um, actively involved in searching out and documenting um, the public history of slavery in New York. Um, our students in the MPA program uh, are studying to be people who do oversight and investigation, policy analysis and different related fields, they found that this tied very closely to what they were attempting to do in their careers. And so we launched this database with the idea of making it available to scholars and researchers who wanted to know more about slavery, because there are all these little silos of information throughout the state and never had this information been brought together. A person would have to find a little document here and a little piece of information there and then attempt to cobble them together. Our database enabled someone to put in a piece of information or do a search for information and all at once find everything there was to understand or what, what is known about a particular enslaver, an enslaved person. We, in the first year, had documented, I think, something on the order of 4,000 different people who were enslaved in New York State. Um, we were able to find out where people lived. We found records of who they married, sometimes where they were buried. But for the first time, we were beginning to develop a picture of what slavery looked like in our state. When we went public with our database, we immediately began to hear from other people doing this kind of research they were able to fill in gaps. They had their own information from their own research. We had people who um, were able to correct some of our records. And there were people who, like us, were trying to find answers. And so we found ourselves in New Jersey working with, um, with a historical society in Monmouth County um, that was trying to put together a database of its own. And we helped them to create the New Jersey Slavery Records Index and before long, we were reaching out to other communities throughout the state of New York and some in New Jersey and gathering more information. We began to hear from people in Rhode Island and Connecticut and Massachusetts. And over time, we developed a consortium of institutions, which is now known as the Northeast Slavery Records Index. And all of these institutions now are located in one database that enables us to construct a picture of the institution of slavery in the Northeastern United States going from the 1500s to the 1850s. Um, sorry. <clears throat> Throughout our research, we have, we have, um, we find our database, we've connected the dots on a lot of people. We can now trace people who were enslaved in New York to Canada, to Connecticut, to Massachusetts and other states. But more importantly, we are now able to give a full history of people who literally were invisible, invisible. Well, previously, we had no idea they even existed or where they existed. We were now able to understand where people were enslaved, where they lived, how they lived, who they lived with, um, what happened to them in many cases. In many cases, we only know snippets of information, but we're now beginning to um, reconcile ourselves to the fact that there is a history that that was heretofore unknown that we can now give um, a clearer depiction of. As a result of our work, um, we've been able to 
work with several other institutions, as I've said, and we just recently uh, won a grant that will enable us to continue our research. Ned and I started this sort of on our own with no funding, with no real sense of how to do it. Um, as, as someone who's worked with Ned for over 40 years now, his, his approach has always been to figure out the big stuff and the little stuff will sort of find its way. Um, so we just started by the seat of our pants, but as we've grown bigger and as we've found more stuff, we realized that we couldn't reach everything. So we've begun to seek funding and we recently received a grant that will enable us to go and dig out some of those pockets of information we haven't been able to reach, working with our sister institutions throughout the Northeast um, over the next year that will en enable us to build a larger database that will be a resource for not only um, for scholars who are doing this kind of work, but for students who want to learn more about slavery and pursue research through that, work, that area. Ned? Great, thanks. I'm gonna put up a, um, a chart. <clears throat> Let me see if I can make it a little bit bigger. Now, um, can, I hope that's visible. Um, this is a, a this is just telling a bit of the story of, of the Northeast in three states, but um, uh, and I think you may see some interesting patterns in it. Um, for New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, and for the United States, we first have the earliest year of enslavement, and 1626 is when they showed up in New Ham New Amsterdam. But um, Judy Lynn mentioned um the 1500s, and, and we do have records of Esteban Gomez, who was a ship captain with uh, uh, associated with Christopher Columbus, who uh, sailed up the Hudson River thinking that he was going to figure out how to get to China. And he went a certain way up and got to some of the waterfalls and determined that that wasn't going to work. And so he came back down and then wondered what he should bring home as um, evidence of his, um, of his trip. And basically he captured 58 indigenous people on the Hudson River and took them back to Portugal to be enslaved. And, um, and uh, they actually, the king didn't want to enslave them, but on the other hand, didn't send them back. And so um, that actually is the earliest example of enslavement in New York and New Jersey um, and Connecticut or wherever it happened. Um, I think it probably was in New York, uh, but it was enslavement of indigenous people. Uh, but then you look at the, the next line is the latest year of enslavement. And you'll, you, you'll see that we list 1840. I could actually list 1848 for New York, even though we're told that slavery ended in 1827. And the reason is that people who, that under the, there was a law that was passed when John Jay was president to gradually end enslavement. And it provided that the children born to enslaved mothers would have, to, would be free after serving 25 years for women, 28 years for men in an enslavement like indenture. And so you then have people, I'm going to show you later, a 22-year-old, a person born, uh, born in uh, 1822, who was then indentured for 28 years. And so, you know, you have enslavement going on way after we say that it stopped. Um, you'll see the highest recorded number of enslaved people. New York was definitely the leader. Um, in, in it of these three states, but then you're seeing um, the highest number in the United States was, um, was um, 3 million 900,000 when you're looking everywhere. Um, the 1790 count of enslaved people, we had 21,000 enslaved people in New York State. 
but there were 694,000 enslaved people across the country. So by then, enslavement in the Northeast was a smaller uh, amount compared to other places. Um, in 1790, 80% of the Black people in New Jersey were enslaved. 88.9% of the Black people in New York were enslaved, 40% in Connecticut, and 92% of the Black people in the United States were enslaved. Um, in, um, in 1790, 6% of the people in New York and New Jersey were enslaved of the overall population, 1.2 in Connecticut, and 17.8% of the people in the United States, although Brooklyn in 1790, there were 32.6% of the people in Brooklyn were enslaved by the other 60%. Uh, and so um, we had enslavement that was intense, like the South, going on in, in, uh, in the New York area. Uh, the three states, New Jersey, New York, and Connecticut, passed the gradual uh, abolition law. Um, John Jay did it in 1799. Um, but you can see, if you then go down further to the date of permanent abolition, you have them in New Jersey passing a gra gradual abolition law in 1804, but not actually abolishing enslavement permanently until 1846. Um, and so, and in New York, they abolished it in 1827, but its effects were still going on. Um, finally, when we did the gradual abolition law, the, in, the enslavers required that they, they didn't want to be raising people that they couldn't own and sell. And so part of the law was that if you didn't want to participate, you could abandon the child of an enslaved mother to the county overseers or the town overseers. Basically take the child away from the mother and give it to the government to pay for it. And in New Jersey, by 1809, 40% of the state budget was being spent on care for these abandoned children of enslaved mothers. I mean, to take it away, uh, take the child away. 1804, we had 6% in New York. And of course, as New York is inclined to do, their solution was to stop funding it. Um, they, uh, they said, well, you know, we induced you to do this, but we're not going to be paying for this care anymore, which created a variety of crises. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is to, rather than talk about what we're doing, I'm going to give you, let me see how I, oh, I'm going to stop sharing, and I'm going to start sharing. Now we're going to do a different one. We're going to actually look at the Northeast Slavery Records Index. And here it is. And, um, and what I'm going to do, this is this Northeast Slavery Records Index. And in a little while, we'll go back and we'll show you the project, which is the American Council of Learned Societies grant project. But, and that has the information about how to apply and what to do. But we're going to go to do a, a community locality report. We're going to do it live. And so I'm going, to go, I'm, I'm going to go to Massachusetts, and we're going to look at Suffolk County, which is where Boston is. Um, I'm choosing it because it's got a variety of different kinds of records in it. Although we have more records in New York. So... This is what you get. Now, this is when you use the, the Northeast Slavery Records Index to zero in on any county or town from New Jersey to Maine. You can pick one and you can see what we've assembled and what we're still assembling in terms of records of enslavement. And that's where we're trying to inform communities about enslavement. So you can see in this first part of the report, we explain the kinds of records, and you can see that most of the records are records of enslavers. Um, so here's um, a, a different way of the present, presenting the kinds of records that are there. But then we have two, we have census records. And unlike in New York, where we'll be showing census records of the US census, 
in Massachusetts, we're only showing the 1754 and 17, uh, uh, the 1754 census because it was, um, um, that was the only census that showed slaves. They abolished slavery before 1790. So we do not get a report of enslaved persons based on census records, but I can show you how this works in a moment in another community. Um, then here are names of enslaved people that are in our database for Suffolk County, which is where Boston is. And so we have 348 individualized records of enslavement and you can see the names of the people um, sorted by their first name, although you can sort them in a variety of ways. Then we go down and we see now the names of the enslavers and we have 833 records of enslavers. Now that's more than the total number of records, but sometimes a record tells the name of the enslaver and the name of the enslaved person. So some records are counting, counting twice here. But you can see over, over in the, the kind of tag, some of them involve sales or ship inventories, or they identify other kinds of things that are going on in the record. And we'll see more about that. Now, the next is that these are advertisements for fugitive enslaved people from this area. And so, you know, you'll say, well, this person ran away from the subscriber. His name was Constant. He was five feet, 10 inches. If you want to get to a sense of the people, one of the ways to do it is to look at the advertisements because it was in the interest of the, of the enslaver to describe the enslaved person where typically they, they didn't. They, they, they didn't have many records that told us the stories of these people. And so you can see them in these moments where they're pursuing their freedom. And, it's, um, and it, just, it tells you a story. Um, and so there's a lot of people wanting their freedom in Boston. Um, now we have records of sales. And so here you can see three Negro women, one girl, four men and two boys to be sold by Messrs. John and David Jeffers to be seen at John Jeffers house in Brattle Street. So this is a, you know, you can come in and you can offer to buy them. And, um, and so these are, um, these are all of these records. Um, and because we're able to, for example, associate some of these records with Harvard University, with other universities, because the people involved are administrators or professors and, you know, they're, um, we're, we're, we're connecting more and more dots. Um, but you can see there's, there's, there's a bunch of them. Now, these are shipping records. And when we talk about enslavers, we can think about enslavers who are enslaving two people in their home or five people in their workplace or 10 people in their farm. But these are people who invested in ships. The first one invested in the Daphne and enslaved 496 people. These were the ships that went to Africa, kidnapped the people and brought them back around. And so, um, so what we did was to track down the name of the, um, of the um, investors, because when we think of, you know, we can use the term slaveholder, which we don't use, but it implies holding an individual person. We think that enslavers include the people who invested in the slave ships. And so we count them in the records. And we think that they need to, they, the accountability needs to extend up the chain. Um, but you can then see, you know, this is a ship constructed in Boston, registered in Charleston. The voyage began at Liverpool. Um, they, they, uh, they bought people at Luongo. These are all details that are in, this, in these records. Then we go down, and this is just telling one community about their history. Um, and so then here are narratives and biographies of enslaved people. Where do we have, sometimes enslaved people wrote their own biographies or wrote stories about themselves or wrote journals or sometimes family members wrote about them or historians wrote about them. So this is a chance if you say, well, how can I learn more about these people? Well, we, we, this is in effect a digital bibliography 
that names names. And so you can look into the people that you're studying and you can do this for Albany, New York. You can do this for, you know, in, in some place in New Jersey. It's all over the Northeast. And so now this is a new one where we're identifying governance leaders who are enslavers. And so we've, we've identified um, a governor um, uh, who uh, was associated also with Harvard University. And interestingly enough, we've also identified um, a James Bowden, who if you go to Bowdoin College and read about Bowdoin College and their famous namesake and see the picture on the wall, they don't really say a lot about this. But um, we now, if you go to Bowdoin, Connecticut, uh, go Bowdoin, uh, uh, Maine, and you proceed to analyze, look at their record that comes up as, and, and I, I'm looking forward to Bowdoin College noticing this. Um, then we have here, this is an attempt to figure out enslaved people who fought on the side of one side or the other in the Revolutionary War. Now, sometimes I, they, they typically there was some incentive for them to do this, although it wasn't. I mean, sometimes it was just that they were treated with more respect, but sometimes it, they were going to earn their freedom. Um, and so here we've got various ways of identifying them. But you can see here B.O.N. stands for the Book of Negroes, which is the inventory list of of enslaved people who ran away to fight for the Brits. And, and according to the Treaty of Paris, which resolved the Revolutionary War, these people got to travel to, to emigrate to Canada. And so these are people who were fighting on the side of the Brits. Now in the battlefield, they met the other people who were fighting on the side of the colonists. Now DAR is the Daughters of the American Revolution. And they have books of records of people fighting in the Revolutionary War. And the problem with the books is that they frequently will identify someone as being a, a Black person or a Native American, but they don't necessarily indicate whether they were enslaved. Sometimes they do, but sometimes we, they don't. Um, and yet we know from percentages of Black people being enslaved that probably a lot of the people were enslaved at some point in their lives. So when we don't know, we just put D-A-R question mark. When we do, we then indicate we have a D-A-R-E-N-S, which means a D-A-R documented enslaved person. But we can go, we can put our lens around different places in the Northeast and watch the battles of the Revolutionary War. Who was fighting on what side? Um, then, um, this is um, other records about the area. This happens to be, we have a, an article called The Art of Enslavement, which basically is, is identifying portraits in museums of enslavers and portraits in museums of enslaved people. And so this happens to come up. This is a picture of, uh, of a, uh, of a uh, this, actually the museum has lots of enslavers. Um, and so then we go down a little further and there are sites of interest. And then we have advocates. Now advocates, we attempted to, besides identifying people who were enslavers, we also wanted to identify people who opposed or came to oppose enslavement. And we're very interested in someday documenting you know, the difference between the Northeast states and the Southern states is that the Southern states um, didn't stop enslavement. They didn't change their mind until it was done to them. The Northeastern states each made an internal choice to end enslavement, sometimes slowly, sometimes more quickly. And, and so we can look at institutions and we can see the institution populated churches particularly You'll find early on they had enslavers and later on they had advocates. And we can see the, the trend in the changes of organizations as people change their minds. But we also see the nature of the advocacy here. This is a lot of Underground Railroad stuff because people were coming from the South through New York and going into New England. Um, 
Then furthermore, we have the ability for you to do a lot of other research. You've got this pile of records and you might have questions about something in Boston. So for example, here's a whole bunch of questions you can ask. You can ask all kinds of things. You can ask for legal documents or kidnappings or female enslavers. You know, where are the female enslavers? What's the story with them? And crimes and deaths and, and uh, financial records and so forth. But let's just look, here's one. This tag is for records that show a child being separated from his or her parents in a slave trade. And so here we can go and we can click on, and now we can look down here and we can see all of the records in our Suffolk County, Massachusetts data set of people being separated from their parents. And you can do this in New Haven, Connecticut. You can do this in, in, in New Rochelle, New York. You can do this you can drill into the story of enslavement in a community very deeply and very honestly, very painfully. And so this is the this is the um, an example of uh, of one of these records, and we can show you some more. But what Judy and I wanted to do before we ended this was to, and I'm going to stop the share, was to drill into some stories of enslaved people that we've encountered. And so I'm going to do two. Uh, we're going to alternate. Uh, but Judy Lynn is first going to do an enslaved person named Abigail. And she will tell you more about Abigail. Abigail is interesting because she was a person who lived in the household of John Jay. And uh, of course, being at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, a college named for a person who was known to be an enslaver and known to be an abolitionist. We have a kind of complicated history. Um, Abigail was a young woman who was enslaved by the Livingston family. John Jay married Sarah Livingston. And at that time, Abigail came with her in the marriage and entered the John Jay household. Um, she attended Mrs. Jay and traveled with the family. Um, for several years, they went to New York, to upstate New York, and eventually to Europe. John Jay went to Paris because he helped to negotiate the Treaty of Paris that ended the Revolutionary War. And <clears throat> during that time, <clears throat> Abigail escaped. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, John Jay did make a report of this and sought to have her returned, but eventually he had to leave, return to the United States. Abigail was subsequently caught and she was taken into custody. And <clears throat> when he learned this, John Jay immediately sought to have her returned. So he sent, an, uh, he sent an emissary, Peter J. Monroe, to Paris to negotiate for her release. Abigail, who had been sitting in a prison for a time decided that she would rather be imprisoned in Paris than live in a house as a slave in the United States. And so she remained there and she ultimately died there because she became ill when living in prison. Ned? No, a very sad story. Well, um, since we're talking about public feature, uh, uh, public uh, officials, uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna tell about Ona Judge. And Ona Judge was enslaved in Virginia as Martha Washington's personal attendant. And in 1789, President George Washington brought Ona Judge and other enslaved people from his Virginia plantation to New York because um, that was the uh, um, presidential household. Um, then um, in 1790, went, uh, they went to Philadelphia, which is... Uh, after Congress moved the temporary capital to Philadelphia. Um, the Pennsylvania had passed an Emancipation Act. And if a person who was enslaved resided in Pennsylvania for more than six months, they were entitled to freedom. And so George Washington would rotate the enslaved people living in his household about every five and a half months. 
And when about five and a half months um, came along, um, only Ona Judge had met a lot of people in Philadelphia, just as Abigail had met a lot of people in Paris and came to think of things that uh, as they ought to be rather than as they are. And with the help of some of the, um, of the mm-hmm. abolitionists, um, uh, she escaped. And um, she escaped by ship to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and um, was living there when she was recognized by the daughter of U.S. Senator John Lanchton, who, who immediately informed President Washington that she'd been cited. She apparently had started doing seamstressing. She was she really was very talented. Um, anyway, the president then contacted the Secretary of the Treasury, uh, Oliver Walcott, and uh, basically told uh, him to order the Portsmouth Collector of Customs. That's sort of like someone in the Port Authority uh, that we would know, a guy named Joseph Whipple, to interview her and arrange for her shipment back to Virginia. So he did the interview. But he reported back that her trans- but while her transport might be legally warranted, he could not carry out her in- involuntary shipment without a lot of public outcry and protest. And so he wrote, I shall be happy to facilitate the business to the utmost of my power in obedience to the pleasure of the president. It is with great regret that I give up the prospect of executing the business in the favorable manner that I had first flattered myself that it would be done. In other words, he was telling the president, nope, can't do that. (laughs) So President Washington wrote back to this customs clerk (laughs) in Portsmouth and said, I regret that the attempt you made to restore the girl, um, uh, only judge as she called herself while with us and who without the least provocation abandoned her mistress uh, that she should be that that this should be attended to with so little success and he insisted that Whipple try harder he said the less that is said beforehand and the more celerity used in the act of shipping her when an opportunity presents the better chance Mrs. Washington who is desirous of receiving her again will have to be gratified. Well, Whipple was a very good public administrator and I like to use this case in teaching public administration at John Jay because he, he used the bureaucracy to his advantage and would write back letters and have complications and so forth. And, uh, and so eventually uh, she didn't return. She was still in Portsmouth. And so after George Washington ceased to be president, he attempted to arrange um, through Senator Langston to have um, Oni Judge kidnapped. This is the former president. He's telling this senator to arrange for her to be kidnapped. But Senator Langston had thought better of it. I mean, he's a, in New England and tipped off Ona Judge, who eluded capture. And basically, Ona Judge married, had three children, and remained free in New Hampshire until she died in 1848. And so it's a story of public administration overcoming power. And uh, we're, we're, we're in, in, in our department, we're proud of that. So now, Judy Lynn's going to do Sojourner Truth. Bureaucracy for good, right? <clears throat> um, this was actually a great story because it was in the news yesterday. Um, And it's about Sojourner Truth, who I'm sure everybody has heard about. Um, She actually was raised by the name of Isabella um, because she didn't adopt the name of Sojourner Truth until she was a free woman and out on the road being an activist. Um, But as Isabella, she was born two years early, two years before the Gradual Abolition Act was signed. Therefore, she was destined to be enslaved for the rest of her life. But she was in a household where she had been promised her freedom. And when when her enslaver reneged on that promise, she escaped with her daughter. She subsequently found work in a household and took the name Isabella Van Wagenen, let me get that straight, Wagon. And um, she, so she lived by that name for many years. She found out that her nine-year-old son, Peter, had been sold south. 
And that's problematic for several reasons. First of all, the term being sold South has a very pejorative connotation. People who are in the North being sold South means that they were being punished in some way. Being sold South, you were being sold into much harsher conditions if you were being sent to um, a plantation where you would work out in very harsh harsh conditions. Or if you were really being sold South, you were being sent to the Caribbean where you were essentially worked to death. So when she found out that her son had been sold South, she got very upset naturally because in New York at the time, because the laws had changed, you could not sell someone out of state. That was illegal. And she took the extraordinary step at that time of going to court. So here was a woman, here was a black woman, here was a freed slave or a liberated slave who went into court and argued for the return and release of her son and succeeded. Not only is that extraordinary, <clears throat> but she eventually did get her son back, although his life did not turn out as well as she'd like. But not only did she get her son back, um, she made history in, in doing this. Well, the records of this case disappeared. As with many things, at the time, no one thought paper was all that important. No one wrote anything down with any sense of, well, we'll have this 40 years from now. The records were written by hand. They were put into boxes. Eventually, that court sent those documents to be archived in, up in Albany. And no one could find the records for 194 years until this past winter when a scholar looking to find something else came across these I'm documents. It. Ned is now showing you. Um, this is a document that actually shows what transpired in the Ulster County Courthouse in Kingston, New York. And why this is important is yesterday, those records were returned to, to the Ulster County Courthouse and they were put on display for four hours for anyone who wanted to see them. This is a document that shows that Isabella Van Wagenen went to court and argued on behalf of her son with the aid of two lawyers and her son was eventually returned to them. This is exactly the kind of thing that Ned and I are trying to find. These are the documents that give a real history. I mean, we have Sojourner Truth's own words in her own books about, about what happened in her life. But here are the supporting documents. Here is more evidence. Um, here is the truth about a person who was able to fight for her rights. Uh, so this is why this kind of work is really, really important. And there are probably thousands, if not millions of other documents of this type that um, are sitting somewhere in some church, in some historical society, in some library, in some closet someplace that we're trying to find and digitize and make available to the public. Ned? Yeah, also what we did with Sojourner Truth's biography was that we went through and every time she mentioned a because she was sold back and forth and back and forth. Every time she mentioned a place and an enslaver, we then went back to the records and found the records of the enslaver and the official documents that, that, that where this person was recording something in the census, where this person was registering a child. And um, we know there are more records, but we what we wanted to do was to use her biography as a portal to then look at what the records are that are behind it and actually to confirm um, um, to confirm the, um, the the story that she tells, you know, that you can really, you could go to the place, you can see, you can see things. So I'll have one more story and then we're gonna open it up to questions. This is a quick one. It is a story about George Kirk. Uh, George Kirk, um, uh, was enslaved in Georgia. He hid out on a ship and uh, managed to get to New York and was enchained when he was climbing off of the ship. Uh, and so um, he was placed in chains. Um, and a dock worker heard him enchained in the ship and reported this to Sidney Howard Gay, who is a, an abolitionist and a 
as an underground railroad person. Uh, and Gay immediately contacted his colleague, John Jay II. Now this is John Jay Jr. It is actually John Jay's grandson. And, and my plan B is if someday we have to rename the college, I'm gonna say, yeah, we ought to rename it after this guy because he is a class act. Um, but anyway, uh, they engaged John Jay II, who really used the, the, the family resources that he had to finance himself as, an, as a lawyer for uh, the Underground Railroad, for people who are trying to escape slavery. So he files a writ to bring Kirk to court. And the captain of the ship says that Kirk admitted to him directly that he was a slave, that he was escaping from slavery. And so John Jay introduces this argument that according to the law of the, of the Fugitive Slave Act, you couldn't rely on the testimony of an enslaved person because they were known to want to lie. So therefore their testimony was explicitly um, not admitted. And so he says, well, you, if, you, you can't, if you can't use his direct testimony, then you certainly can't use a hearsay version of his testimony, so it's inadmissible, which was a, 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 a clever argument at the time, turning the law on its, on its, uh, on its head. Um, and then Jay argued that under the law, no one in New York, no person can imprison another person. A, a court can jail someone, various things can happen, but at that time in the law, this was in the 1840s, uh, um, it was not possible for someone to enslave someone or imprison someone without due process of law. And the judge agreed. Now, generally speaking, what tended to happen was that when you then released someone from jail, there were people waiting at the door so that when the jailer opened the door, um, people associated with Richard Riker, an interesting name, Richard Riker was um, very often the, effectively the prosecutor and he had a Riker's gang that would proceed to then bring them back into court again and try to send them off. But basically, um, Kirk escorted uh, uh, Sydney uh, was escorted to Cindy Howard Gay's office by a crowd, and then um, then the ship captain contacts the mayor, Mayor Mickel of New York, who was an he believed in enslavement um, and believed in he basically believed that if we weren't going to enslave black people, we should send them back south or send them to Europe or send them to Africa. Anyway, he directed the police to arrest Kirk. So John Jay encouraged a black office worker to climb into an American Bible Society crate, which they put onto a, a, uh, a wagon and attached to some horses, and then proceeded to have the, the, the horses come galloping out of the, uh, out of the building um, with the, the sight of, uh, of a black person looking out uh, from the underneath the, the, from the, from the top of the crate, which absolutely got the attention of the police. And they proceeded to be galloping after the horses and they galloped off into the, into the distance. And at the same time, then, um, uh, well, when they finally stop the cart, then they open it up and it's not the person they're looking for. And so they'd been fooled and they realized that Sidney Howard Gay and John Jay II fooled them. Meanwhile, uh, John Jay took George Kirk out of the back and took them to a place where he could be quickly transported to Boston. And he appears uh, in uh, 30 years later, still working as a shoemaker and cobbler in Boston. And so it's a, it's a story of, of um, I mean, I like to end with some sense of hope. And um, this, is, this is a story of, of, of reformers taking matters into their own hands. And um, so we wanted to close just by sharing with you, first of all, just some, some information. Let me be sure, I, I think I have it. Let me just share it. Um, 
we wanted to give you, no, I don't think that that. Well, now I don't, hmm. I thought I had it there. Um, I was going to give you the links to uh, to Nesri, but I'm going to do it differently. I'm going to take That's up on, and, it's in the chat. Okay. And, and it's, there's a long name, but there's a short name. We set up a very brief little URL that if you put it in, it takes you to the complicated URL, N-E-S-R-I dot U-S. NESRI.us gets you there, but I did want to show you if you go to the home page and then you go down slightly, you'll see this article, <clears throat> which we just opened up today, um, small contracts to locate and index slavery records. And this is a grant we've received uh, that allows us, and we're going to try to double this grant, perhaps even triple it, but right now it allows us to authorize 14 small grants of no more than 5,000 um, to look for enslavement records in particular communities. And we're going to, this is, a, a, this is a little bit like hunting for oil. We know where, I'm going to stop for this phone ringing for a sec. I'm sorry. Um, anyway, we know where there are slave records and um, um, we, we just need some local help in finding them. And uh, you'll see um, this, 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 this article then tells uh, the, 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 the pro about the project and it has a link where you can express interest in it. And then we'll put you on our circulation list for um, for more information about workshops and uh, other um, kinds of um, um, kinds of information about it, and so there'll be three different. We'll be awarding some of them in in um, in August, some of them in um, in um, October, and some of them in February. So I'm now going to stop the sharing. And we can open it up for questions. Thank you. I want to thank you both. Um, and I want to give a quick summary of all the topics you touched on. <laughs> um, this this uh, presentation is being recorded. And so we will have this on YouTube. But I want to just touch on a, a couple of things that you, that you spoke about. Um, I really want to thank you both for, while circling in on New York State, and then the broader Northeast region, you also introduced a diasporic um, sense of things, i.e. A, a, a challenging of national boundaries when you were speaking about the Book of Negroes um, and the British side, you know, those enslaved men who fought for the British side during the Revolutionary War, um, which is interesting for me as someone who does, who that's my specialty, diasporic work. And I say that because when you touch on men and women, but you know, because we know, you know, Harriet Tubman fought right for for the Union Army in, in during the Civil War. Um, you touch on a legacy that continues into this day, i.e., peoples, enslaved peoples throughout this hemisphere fought for the side that guaranteed them freedom, right? And we see this to this day with undocumented men and women and human beings who fight for citizenship, right, here in the United States. Right. You touched on the legacy of separation of parents and their children, which, again, you founded it. You, you centralized it in this history, which, you know, in recent years, we think of with regards to immigrants, migrants, undocumented peoples. Right. Coming to the United States, primarily from Central and South America. So I thank you both for that. You touch on the start of um, enslavement dating it at 1619, but I wondered about the inclusion of 1539, given that Florida, which would put it at 80, 80 years prior, because of course, Florida and the Gulf Coast was part of the Spanish empire. Um, and so again, expanding it um, and, and just the legacies of slavery going even further back than we know. 
um, you touched on Richard Riker. Um, and so the history of, I mean, for those of us who are very familiar with Rikers Island, but have never thought about what, what that land is and thinking about the fact that it was owned by someone who was employed to go capture folks who were trying to emancipate themselves, right, is a deeply troubling legacy to me. And it actually really resonated with me. And finally, when you were speaking about um, the John Jay II case, right, in which enslaved peoples were thought to have been unreliable to provide their own testimony in court, which goes against, right, the Sojourner Truth um, court case. And again, the legacies of enslaved peoples suing for freedom, which is throughout this hemisphere, um, it reminds me of the time where this is in the 19th century, it was thought that those who tried to free themselves um, suffered an illness called drapetomania, right? And so if you wanted to be human and free and you were of African descent, if you were black, you were quote unquote sick. And so I, I sat here and I was listening to all of what you presented to us. And I just wanted to say that again, for the record, well, I think just to follow up on one of the things that you said, we have indexed all of the people from the Northeast states mm -hmm. who appear in the in the ship registries emigrating to Canada, uh, the so-called Book of Negroes. Mm -hmm. And what's very interesting is that there are, are, are Black loyalist historical societies all in that area. And um, and. What they know about their black community is what happened after they got to Canada. And they've been very helpful in my own community. We knew that there were two people, their last names were Cox and Cole, who ran um, from, who joined the, the, um, the, uh, the, the Brits and then fought in the Revolutionary War in Mamaroneck. And we know they went to Canada but we discovered that they brought wives and children. They'd gotten, they'd, they'd, they'd formed families while they were in the British army. And we learned about where they actually landed and then where they, one of them actually settled. And one of them was part of a group that was so frustrated with the way the Brits were treating them. I mean, they put them in the woods and they wouldn't allow them to come down and do commerce in the in. I mean, it was terrible that he went to Sierra Leone and then he died fighting for liberty in Sierra Leone. He was shot by the British in, in Sierra Leone. But the interesting thing was to send our our Northeast Slavery Records Index to those historical societies because we could say to them, look, you know these people when they got to your side of the ocean. Right. Right. We know all about them before they left. And so we've got stories and information mm. and documents to give you, and you've got stories and information to give us. And it's, they have, I mean, we're talking about having a memorial in the Merrimack. And those two people are already in a memorial in Canada. They're in a big memorial to the to the to the black loyalists who came back, who came over. And um, and so it, it's ironic that they would be honored in Canada, but not yet honored in, in, in the United States. But we're going to do something with that. Well, I thank you for that, because that I we have two questions in the chat and I want to pose them both to you. This one directly relates to what you just said is, are there any plans around creating landmarks? around enslavement and free people in and around New York City, similar, or New York, similar to how Germany has places and spaces identified as part of the Holocaust throughout the country. So that's one. So the Mamaroneck Memorial is one. The second is um, regarding the Nesri site itself, right? Can students learn to use it easily? And do you have examples of ways of faculty using it? So one about memorials and one about the Nesri site. Well, I'll answer the memorial one. And Judy, you can answer the one about the instructional one. Um, where um, one of the reasons we do the community report is because we found, we originally thought people would be interested in this for genealogical reasons. People would be searching for their ancestors. Mm -hmm. But we discovered that what that communities were trying to figure out their histories of enslavement so that they could understand the history and then commemorate 
the history. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of our purposes is to help the communities. I mean, for a community to replicate what we've done would be a couple of years of research, you know, fishing around in places where, you know, it's, it's, when we coded it all up, they can find in, in moments. Um, and so that's part of what we're, we're trying to encourage is that kind of memorialization. But we also think that part of it is the, um, is, is having the information and teaching the information that there's a live memorialization, which comes from, from talking about it. Also, one of our partners in Connecticut is the uh, Stepping Stones project, which has, um, which has names of enslaved people in small markers around communities all over Connecticut. And we're, you know, we're working with those communities to now think in a larger scale about their um, their um, their memorials, but um, but we we we're also supporting communities who want to do the stepping stone kind of um, uh, kind of approach too, which is going on now. That group has moved beyond Connecticut, and they're doing it all over um, New England, and they're one of our one of our our partners in the Northeast Slavery Records Index. When we created our database, um, we were thinking about it as a scholar's tool. <clears throat> and so, of course, we made it as complicated and as obtuse as possible. Um, no, we made it, we, we did what we could do at the time. But as we began to work with our partners, um, they came back and said, you know, this is not an easy to use interface. And so we have been working to make our website easier to access. I think that any student who looks at it and reads the instructions, we have very clear instructions in there, can use it. Anybody in the public can use it. Um, and I have encouraged students to, you know, to go in there and look, look around. It's the kind of thing that once you get the hang of how to use it, it becomes very easy to use. One of our earliest um, uses of the, of the database was by uh, a professor in the history department who immediately found a way to employ it in her classroom. Um, and she had her students do two things. In one class, she had her students look at the 1741 slavery uprising, um, which was a very major trial in New York City. Um, and she had her students study that trial and then answer a whole bunch of questions and take um, on the roles of different people and try to talk about the whole issue from their perspective. In another class, she had her students look into some of the enslavers because we had information about people, but not about the people they enslaved. And so students looked at whatever they could find about those enslavers and see if we could find out anything more about the people they enslaved. Now we've got commitments from other departments. Well, the history department has made a commitment to rethink its entire curriculum. And so they've actually been using the, the slavery index to um, revise the curriculum in their history classes. Um, and instead of as you know, I'm part of the curriculum committee, so there's been a lot of discussion over the last decade about dead white men and Western civilization dominating the academic curriculum. Um, and so they have made a very conscious effort to use the database to include more voices and to include this history that has always been overlooked. The art department um, has done some marvelous stuff. We gave a grant to a professor who is actually, and it's, it's, it's very difficult to explain without showing it, but he's developing slavery kits, slave kits. Um, he's developed, there is a very famous image of an enslaved person in change, kneeling down and holding up his, his hands, his clenched hands. And that was the logo of the Manumission Society. And he has created a kit where you can actually build one of those, those um, figures. Um, and he's having his students build those and he's going to take pictures of them. So they're gonna have an exhibit. Um, another of our art professors has actually written um, a book about, um, I believe it's called Toppling Statues or Tumbling Statues, 
um, Aaron Thompson has written a book about this whole movement now to reconcile ourselves to our history and what do we do about it. So she challenges that whole question of now that we're revealing this history, we know about it, what do we do about it? Um, we just got contacted by somebody in the sociology department who is now looking to revise her curriculum. Uh, and of course, the elephant in the room is John Jay himself. Um, students have asked on many occasions, what do we do about what we know about John Jay? And as I said, he has a complicated history on both sides of the institution of slavery. So um, I have been advocating for, many many professors have actually done this in, in, on a smaller scale, um, have conversations around um, what we're learning and what we still need to know about the institution of slavery and John Jay's and the whole Jay's family world family's role in it. Ned and I met with descendants of the Jays, and I actually invited them. I'm actually going to meet with um, one of them next week, but we've invited them to come to the college and talk to the, talk to our students about that. And I think it's a remarkable opportunity for our students to ask questions because they're just, you know, now encountering this. And, and I think the question is, you know, if so, so what, what do we do with this information? other than get mad, other than, you know, wring our hands and say, this is awful. How do we move forward from this? And how does this, how does this knowledge empower us to make better choices and to make choices about our future? Because so much of what we're dealing with now comes from what happened in the 18th and 19th century. So yeah, this is going to be an ongoing um, activity, even as we collect more information. We want to involve students in it. We want students to use it. We want students to take this information out into the world with them. May I ask you both if you could please type your email addresses in the chat. And I say that because I know we have folks who are would be who would love to be in contact with you. Um, I cannot underscore how extraordinary it is that you said an entire department is looking over their curriculum and then members of art are incorporating it, members of the sociology department. I mean, that is fantastic. And congratulations to you both. I mean, I think, again, the work that you are doing really puts you in, in conversation with those committees that were established as at Rutgers, as I said before we came on, um, certainly the University of Virginia, Harvard, you know, all of these, these committees that are looking at the histories of enslavement that undergird the university's Georgetown, right? Um, and so I, I thank you both for that. Um, well, let's give credit where credit's due. Um, to a large extent, this is a student-led initiative. Our mm -hmm. students have been pushing for us to rethink our curriculum for years. Mm -hmm. And we've listened, we've had an actively engaged student council and student body that, and, and at Maca our Macaulay program as well. Um, mm -hmm. We have revised curriculum throughout the program, throughout many of our programs, because students have demanded, you know, to see a curriculum that reflects their histories as well as, you know, Western civilization. Um, we, are, we have looked at ways to expand our horizons and, and give our students a uh, an education that has much more meaning for them. Um, we're big proponents of usable knowledge. And I think that our we produce usable knowledge when we include everybody. I, so let's give them credit. Thank you for that. I, I, I love, again, this is going to be, this recording is going to be on YouTube. And so the John Jay students will know this. Um, certainly all CUNY students should know this, right? I mean, certainly at Macaulay, Macaulay Honors College, we know that our John Jay cohort in particular is one um, that is, all of our students are, are committed to social justice, but that is a key component of the John Jay cohort. Um, and so again, in the interest of time only, am I, am I ending this program? I wanna thank you both for joining us this afternoon, again, in commemoration and in honor of the Juneteenth observance. For those who do not know um, or who don't remember, again, Juneteenth was the date by which three years after the end of the Civil War that those enslaved peoples in Texas found out that they had been freed for three years. The news just got to them in 18, at the end of 1868 at that. And so with that, um, Happy CUNY Friday tomorrow. 
Uh, mm-hmm. Juneteenth lands on Sunday, and so we will be observing it as a federal holiday this year on Monday. Take good care all, and thank you again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.